everybody. How's everyone doing? So good to see you. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. If this is your first time joining with us today, I, I want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for being our guest. And everyone that's watching online, if you're just getting your last licks in before school begins and everything goes back to sort of, sort of normal, we want to welcome you as, as well. Can you guys do me a big favor? We do this every week. Let everyone know how much better it is here. We want them here. Let's welcome all our new folks and everyone watching online. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I just got back, and I sent my wife and I and our children, we all dropped off our, our firstborn at college. And it was, a, it was a very interesting thing. I'm telling my wife, honey, he's going to be fine. He's going away. He's not. And next thing I know, all of a sudden, there's something. I had like some, some problem with my sinuses and, <laughs> and all the allergies, and I just didn't know what was going on. My nasal passages got swollen, and yeah, and I had this lump in my throat. So I don't know what's going on with me, but I'm doing okay. He's doing fantastic. My oldest son, Luke, so we're so excited. And dropped him off at Oral Roberts University, a great university in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, I drove for about 25 hours uh, in total, so yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. So if I'm walking like this a little bit, there's a reason why. But uh, we're in a series called The Sermon on the Mount. It's a certain kind of noise. What is that? You guys hear it too? Okay. All right, I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> I'm going to ignore it. Let me get some water first, and it'll be okay. It reminds me, actually, uh, you know, do you know why you're not supposed to drink toilet water? I just thought I'd share it with you. There's two reasons. Number one and number two. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. We are doing a sermon series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It is an amazing uh, uh, sermon. It goes from chapter 5 to chapter 7 in Matthew, and he talks amazingly what it, what it means to live in the kingdom, what it means for us to have the right heart and to do the right things. And so today we're getting to the whole thing that everyone likes to talk about. How many folks have noticed that there's people right now, a lot of people are judging? Have you guys noticed that? Yeah, a lot of people, I mean, people judge you all the time. You say the wrong thing, you're judged, you're canceled, you're gone, you're gone. You say the wrong thing, you don't say the politically correct thing, or you don't, if you say the politically correct thing, you get in trouble. If you don't say the politically correct thing, you get in trouble. No matter what you say, you're in trouble, and you get canceled, right? Have you noticed that, everybody? Yeah, we live in a society today, there is no grace. You make a mistake off with your head, and that's what's happening in our culture today. In fact, it's very interesting. Sometimes the most judgmental people people can think of is people who go to church. In fact, the Pew Research and Gallup, uh, Pew Research and Barna, excuse me, not Gallup, they got together to do a survey with over 10,000 people, which is a huge survey. And they asked them, what do you think about people who go to church, believers? What is the top three things that come in your mind when you think about believers. This is what they said. The number one thing they don't like about the church is that we are judgmental. They said we can't stand how judgmental, oh, thank you, how judgmental the church is. And uh, is that because I mentioned toilet water? That's, that's regular water, by the way. Okay. Um, so they mentioned that it's judgmental is the number one reason they don't like. Second reason they don't like about it because they think the church is against everybody which is they're hypocritical. We say one thing, and we do exactly what we criticize the world from doing. That's what they say about the church. And finally, you know, the number three thing is, is that we, we anti-gay, that the church hates and judges gay people for everything. So those are the three things. Aren't you happy you came to church today to learn that? But those are the three things that people often judge the church upon, that we are they're judgmental, we're hypocritical, and we're anti-gay. Well, I have news for you. We're actually going to be talking about the whole thing of sexuality, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what about the LGBTQYX and all that. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to do it very compassionately and very factually and very biblically. We're going to be doing that in October. It's going to be called Designer Sexuality, and we're going to look at all these things, including abortion and all these controversial topics. I have news for you. This will not be a botching match. We're not going to be like throwing people to the walls, but we're going to look what the Bible has to say because there's a lot of confusion today and a lot of people are needlessly suffering and we need to see what the Bible says about these things and how we 
can intersect with our culture. We're even going to bring a guest who's going to be speaking to us who used to live that lifestyle, who thought she was a man at one time. She'll be sharing with us as well on one Sunday. So I encourage you, we'll let you know what's going on each week in case you don't want your kids to be here. I guarantee you what we're going to talk about is going to be a lot better than you hear on television uh, or anyplace else for that matter. But we just need to talk about these things because the Bible tells us what we are to believe. But we're to do it in the right way. And today we're talking about judgmentalism. Okay, so Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about this. And this is the scripture verse almost everyone knows, even atheists know this one. This is the most famous scripture verse in our Western culture is this. Judge not lest you be judged. Right, we hear that all the time. Who are you to judge me? Don't tell me what to do. You're judging me. But the funny thing is, you can't get away from judgment. Because if someone says you're judging me, guess what they're doing? They're judging you for being judgmental. So you can't get away from it. It's in our culture today, and people uh, will assign meanings to people, and it's really scary what's happening in our culture today. It's really quite mean. So judge not that you not be judged. So does this mean we're not supposed to say anything? Are we supposed to say nothing about society? Are we supposed to just let happen what happened? Are we supposed to just be loving to everybody? I love you. you the Barney Christianity? You know what Barney Christianity is, don't you? I love you. You love me. Hello, boys and girls. Okay. Is Barney still around? Is Barney still around? Is he, is he gone? Okay. I grew up with Barney, with my kids, okay? And Thomas the tree. I'm going to start crying. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> Judge not that you not be judged, okay? And so we're going to go ahead and read the scriptures, and we're going to go back and look at it line by line. So let's look at what Jesus had to say in this passage of scriptures. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your other eye. So we're just going to look at it right now and see what that all means, okay? So right here, we, we go on. We're not done yet. Jesus continues to go on and says this, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. Now, what is Jesus talking about? He says not to judge, right? Don't judge. And here at the end, he's talking about He's talking about this. What is he talking about? He's talking about dogs. So you're going to judge people and call them dogs? How many, when's the last time you called someone a dog? Okay. I don't usually go around and call people dogs. So what is Jesus talking about? He says not to judge. And then he says, well, if someone's acting like a dog, well, how do you know someone's acting like a dog unless you judge them? And how do you know someone's acting like a pig? So what is Jesus talking about here? This is confusing. He says, judge not, and then he tells us to judge. And then later on he says, judge. So what is he talking about? What does that mean? Well, we should not judge. That's my major point. We should not judge. That's the first point, all right? Judge not, that do not be judged. Here's the second point. We should judge. You guys ready to go home? No, don't, don't leave, okay? So we should not judge, and we should judge. What on earth is Jesus talking about? Well, I'm so glad you said so, because the word judge here has a diff 15 different meanings. So I could tell you the Greek uh, word and, and tell you the different meanings, but you see, everybody, and when you interpret Scripture, what you have to do is you have to read the passage of Scripture it's found, and you have to look at the context of where it's written. What's the context of the passage? What's the context of the entire Sermon on the Mount? And it's by that that you will discern what it means. And also, you use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So taking one verse, cutting it out, putting it on your dashboard is fine if you understand the context. In real estate, they tell you this. Location, location, location. In biblical interpretation, it's context, context, context. So when Jesus is using the word here... He's talking about having a judgmental way of judging where you are a complete evaluation of someone. Because, listen, all of us judge today coming to, coming to church. Hopefully you judged. 
When I get out of my driveway and I try to merge into the highway, I judge how far the car is from me. And then we pull on, right? You judge if you want to have Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. Okay? And I've, I don't like any of them now. Now, now. now I'm a coffee snob. Now I go to these roastery places. And now, yeah, I'm a coffee snob and I do pour overs, okay? Judge me. Go ahead. So we should judge or we should not judge. Well, what does that all mean? And look what Jesus has to say as we, as we look at this. He says this. Beware. This is the same passage of Scripture. He just said, do not judge, right? Same passage of Scripture, same chapter. He goes on and says this. Beware of false prophets. Well, how are you supposed to know if someone's a false prophet if you don't judge? Do you see that, everybody? Okay? You who come to you in sleep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So there's nothing wrong if someone gives me an apple and says it's a pear. I say, no, it's not a pear. You're being judgmental. No, this is an apple. Now, if I start beginning to judge the apple, that's different. And so you can judge on someone. If someone says something to you and it's not true, you can look at it, evaluate it, and say what it is. The difference is when we get into the point of assigning motives to people, not only do I talk what you did right or wrong, now I know the reason you did it. I know what you did. Now, I don't know if you recognize this, but how many of you are married in this room? Okay, how many of you have noticed that you, you're experts of reading your spouse's mind, right? You know the reason why your spouse does what your spouse does. You have all the motives down. How many like being mis, misquoted, right? Often people think they can read people's minds. There's only one person that knows someone's heart. Guess who it is? God. God's the only one who knows a person's heart. You and I can't see that deep. So... We are to look at their fruits. So someone says, I'm an apple, and they're a lemon. I said, you know what? You say you're an apple. But I have to be truthful with you. You are a lemon. And so there's nothing wrong with saying that. The problem is when you put judgment on that person and assign motives. So we should not judge. We should judge. Where are we at to then? Okay? We need to judge without being mental. What is that supposed to mean? Well, judge without being judgmental. When you're judgmental, you become mental. I know that's not very um, politically correct. Don't judge me, okay? But seriously, when, you start judge, when you're judgmental, you become judgmental. You don't know what you're talking about. And God gets frustrated with people who are judgmental. He does. Because now all of a sudden, now you, you take the position of God, which we're going to show you in a few moments what that looks like. Well, how are we supposed to judge? This is how we're supposed to judge. This is the one takeaway today. If you can take this away today, you pretty much got the message. Judge without being judgmental. Judge without being judgmental. Because you, when you're judgmental, you become? How, how dare you say that? That's not politically correct. Okay. So this is what it says in Romans 4. Romans 14, 4, the Apostle Paul is talking about Christians judging each other. Now, there are some things that we will not compromise upon. Jesus died on the cross, rose again from the dead, right? The Bible's the word of God. But whether someone drinks alcohol or not is your preference. If you believe in your heart you're not supposed to because you can cause another brother to fall, then don't do it. But don't judge someone that does or judge someone who doesn't, Right? And, and so, for example, if, if you don't let your kids go on an iPad or an iPhone during services, what right do I have to go down to your child and say, hey, no iPhone in church? I can't do that. It's not my child. So what happens is we start judging on secondary issues. I'm sorry, I heard a little spark. I just don't want the place to burn down. So um, I know it's a very ignited sermon, but nevertheless. Um, it sounds like there's like a, a cricket behind there having fun, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm having an ADD moment sponsored by Ritalin. Excuse me. Um, back to what I was talking about. You who are past judgment are the servant of another. Is it before his own master that he stands or falls? And he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. So what the basic thing is this is that who are you to judge somebody else? So we don't judge people. The Bible, says in the, and the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, some people eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now, I know we don't do that today. Okay, but if someone, back in those days, they had different gods they would worship, and they would give them meat sacrifices. 
And people would, you could get it cheaper in the market. And so they said, you're not supposed to eat meat sacrificed to idols. But you know and I know it's fine. But if it causes someone else to sin, don't do it. Don't judge your brother. And so that's what the Bible is saying, not to judge on secondary issues. Well, I can't believe they wear choir robes in church. They have a choir. I can't believe they have smoke. They have smoke in mirrors because there's no presence of God. I can't believe, I mean, we sit there like, and we criticize, but they don't have a cross. They do have a cross. Oh, they have a statue of Mary. And we get all critical about stuff that just frankly doesn't matter. Don't judge. If it's sin to you, don't do it. Does that make sense, everybody? But on the, on the fundamental issues about forgiveness and things of that nature. So we go on, and, and, and James 4, 11 and 12 says this. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Therefore, there is only one lawgiver and judge. He was able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? And he's talking about those within the church. You see, when you become judgmental, you make your own standards, and people need to meet those standards. And if they don't meet those standards, you judge them because you can, meet, you can quote, unquote, meet those standards. Okay? And that's what begins to happen. We judge motives. I think that's the big thing right there. The big test is the motives, and that's what's happening. Now, this is also what happens. God's the only one who's behind the bench with the black robe and the gavel. You and I are so full of sin. You and I can't save ourselves. I don't care if you gave all your money away and you were able to solve world hunger. No more world hunger anymore. And you were a pastor and a preacher and you solved world hunger. Guess what? If you didn't give your life to Jesus, you're not good enough. None of us are good enough. The Bible says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. It's only by God, Jesus, dying on the cross for us, and we accepted his sacrifice. I did nothing on my own merit except accept the sacrifice. And so if I think I'm better than somebody else and that I'm a higher level, no, you're not. No, you're not at a higher level. And so this is what we need to understand. We have to get behind. You're not a judger. You're not behind. You don't have a gavel in your hand. What you say is what the king says, what God says. This is right, this is wrong. But I can't tell you your motive, and I don't stand behind you. Only God has complete knowledge. I do not need it to you. So how do we judge? We judge with great humility, realizing if not for God, who could stand? Realizing that everything has been taken from me, God has forgiven me. You see, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. So how you judge others, God will judge you. Okay? And with the same measure you use, it's not the second coming, is it? <laughs> the Bible says, well, never mind. Judge not that you not be judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Basically this, how you judge others, you'll be judged. In fact, Jesus talked about that earlier in the same passage of Scripture. He talked about the Lord's Prayer. He says, this is what he said. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. So when I pray this prayer nearly every day, I go through the Lord's Prayer and I go to this part, Lord, forgive me like I forgive others. And I start thinking, who are the others I need to forgive? Oh, God, not that person. And sometimes I got to take 15 to 20 minutes to get off my chest. God, I want to. It's okay to tell God how you feel. Tell God how you feel. God, I want to I want to take them out. God, I want to. Oh, I can't stand this person. God, I, oh, oh, oh. And you just tell them how you feel. Tell them how you feel. But Lord, you know what? You forgave me, so I got to forgive them. And so God, forgive me like I forgive others. And so when I work that out, then it changes me when I realize who I am. Well, just as you're supposed to forgive others, you're supposed to judge others like you want to be judged. Do you want to be judged that way? The rabbinic tradition, there are two ways to judge, with the law or with mercy. Which one do you want, everybody? If you judge with judgment, you'll be judged with judgment. If you judge with mercy, you'll have mercy. Does it mean we close our eyes to what's taking place and let go do what you want? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means we do it in the proper context in a proper way. So, we judge with great humility, and we don't judge hypocritically. Hypocritically. That, you know, are you doing the very thing you're accusing someone else of doing? Is that what you're doing? You see, in Romans 2, 
verses 1 through 5, in Romans chapter 1, you want to read Romans chapter 1 after church today, it's amazing. You'll think you just read the homepage of the latest newspaper because it's amazing what it talks about. It talks about how the godless have destroyed themselves. And if you read that passage, you're like, yeah. It's almost like the Apostle Paul is throwing red meat to the Christians. And then he turns the tables on them. He says this, therefore, you have no excuse, O man or woman, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. He's talking about those outside the church here. Because you do, you, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that judgment of God is rightly falls on those who practice such things. He talks about the list of all sorts of things that you and I like to get upset with. Do not suppose, O man or woman, who judge those who will practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God. Are you to presume on the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead to your repentance. Just because God is not giving you what you deserve doesn't give you the right not to do, give you the right to do it. God is very patient with us. He wants none to perish. But because of your hard heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So he's saying, be very, very careful how you are judging because God is giving grace to you. So there has to be a, a humility that is filling our lives. So how do you judge? We judge with great humility. We don't judge hypocritically. And how does that work? look? Well, back to Matthew 7. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your eye? So here I'm sitting. How many of you get a, get a little like a fly in your eye? I remember driving uh, just last night, actually. I was, I was, don't make fun of me, okay? I was rollerblading, okay? And I have knee pads on, a helmet. And I look like, I look like a, a dork, okay? But I, anyhow, that's because I fell one time and hit my head. From now on, I'm going to wear a helmet. So I'm, I'm sitting there, and a fly or something get into my eye, and it was the most annoying thing. When you have something in your eye, you have a speck in your eye, what happens to your eye? It, it swells up, it starts to water, and hey, you got something in your eye, pal. And look what he says here. But you not consider the plank in your own eye. So this is what he's actually saying. It's kind of funny. So you got this thing in your eye, and you're like, let me take the, let me take the thing out of your eye. So I'm going to come down here. Let me take that out of your eye. Am I going to do that? Of course not. Of course, I, I can't. You, you got to get rid of this thing first, right? And so how ridiculous is that? That's what Jesus is saying. When you try to take something out of someone else's eye, you are being completely ridiculous because you got a plank in your eye. And so that's what he's saying here. How can you say, remove the speck? So why does that happen? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye. That's the first thing we got to do. Then what? I like with this quote. Your harshest judgments often reveal your deepest weaknesses. I got a brother, not a, a brother in the Lord, if you will, not in this church. He's always sending me stuff about LGBTQ. He's always sending me about the homosexuals. He's always upset with what's going on. I said, I can't stand it. And he's really judgmental on that community of people, okay? And, and so, and he's talking about that. And I said, well, bro, uh, let me ask you a question, yeah? You told me that you and your wife haven't gotten together in a couple of years, right? Uh-huh. And you, you think it's okay uh, to look at pornography because after all, I'm not doing anything, but I need, you know, I'm a man, and a man has got to do what a man's got to do, right? Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Well, how dare you criticize someone that gives into their same-sex attraction, and you're giving in to your attraction when you're not supposed to even be doing in the first place? So you're a hypocrite. And I say that very humbly, sir, because I have my own issues as well. So who are you? Be very careful. Before you start criticizing other people, are you doing the same thing? Sin is missing the mark of God. And so often, I, I find this happen. In, in the 1980s, there was this, I'm not going to mention the people's names because I don't want to, uh, but there was this evangelist that fell into some major sin. And there was another evangelist, the top evangelist in America, that was criticizing this evangelist for doing sexual impropriety. It found out that the same guy was visiting prostitutes. The guy that was criticizing was on Larry King talking about how horrible this person was. He was criticizing several other people. He was involved in very self. 
You see, we often criticize what we're struggling with ourselves. Why is that? Because I got this big beam in my eye. You ever get, you remember, you ever get a car and you notice everyone else drives the same car? <laughs> right? It's like, what's the deal? I mean, everyone has the same car I have. That's because you are, it's in before your eye. And so if you got this log in your eye, you cannot help someone else out first. So your harshest judgments often reveal your deepest weaknesses. Be very careful. The church is so judgmental, I can't stand it. Really? Yeah. I remember I heard a story of an older man that was sleeping, and his grandchildren put uh, some, th- some stinky cheese on his mustache. And so the, the older man woke up. He's like, this place stinks. He walks around that. This stinks. The whole world stinks. Sometimes the reason why you struggle with something is because it's right under your nose, and you're struggling with yourself. Be very, very careful about that. So we judge with great humility. We, we don't judge hypocritically, right? We're going to make sure we're not doing the same stuff, everybody. It happens all the time. And we judge with redemption. If you enjoy judging someone, don't judge. If you enjoy, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. I tell you, Jesus, turn over the tables. Right? I've heard that so many times. I'm just turning over the tables. Oh, really? But you're enjoying yourself. Jesus was not enjoying himself. Zeal for my house has consumed me. If you enjoy, and listen, everybody, I see it all the time. I see it on Facebook. I see it on Instagram. I see you criticizing the different political figures. How dare you criticizing different people? And we sit there, and we just sit there, and we type away. We tear people all back and forth. We're criticizing everybody. You know, that's, that's really bad. You know what that does? God goes, okay, you're going to be judgmental. Guess what's going to happen to you, pal? You're going to be judged. So what's the proper way to judge? We judge with redemption. If not, if Christ didn't come to me, I would be gone. I'd be gone and so are you. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll be able to see to remove the speck from your other's eye. So yeah, your brother does have a speck. He does. But why don't you take it out of your own eye first? Then, so before you bring correction, do some, self, do some searching. Maybe get a small group if you don't have one. Hey, listen, I'm really struggling right now at work. Everyone at work is so negative. They're so negative. Am I ever negative? Well, to be honest with you, you always have to give your opinion in every small group. And you look down on everybody. But no, you're not negative. <laughs> no. Sometimes you need the faithful or the wounds of a friend. So we got to do a redemption. Remove the speck from your brother's eye. That's what we want to do. See, look what it says in Galatians 6.1. This is how we're supposed to bring correction to those in the God's house, okay? Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of what? Judgmentalism. No, don't cancel. Remember, if not for the Lord, you'd fall. Remember, You were saved by grace, not by yourself. Remember, there's not one that's righteous. No, not one. Remember, all your righteousness is like filthy rags. Now, how many are glad you came to church today? (laughs) The brilliant part of the gospel of Jesus Christ is I don't have what it takes, neither do you, but Jesus does. And he's poured out his grace. So we ought to be the same way. See, restore him with spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted well, you know, you start criticizing someone else and you, you get tempted with the same thing. A number of years ago, no one in this church, and I make that abundantly clear, people say, Pastor, are you talking about me? I didn't talk about you. That's the Holy Spirit or your wife's elbow going on your ribs, not me. <laughs> um, but a number of years ago, it was a very sad thing that happened. Uh, a gentleman was married to a woman and the woman committed adultery and had an extramarital adultery with this guy and she ended up divorcing her husband. And took him for everything he was worth. He lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he was bitter towards her. Oh, my ex-wife. Oh, she's a... And he was like, oh, she's an adulterer. And he was all upset. He was criticizing her all the time. Uh, Every time we went to a men's meeting, he'd talk about how horrible his wife was. Right? Well, he remarries. Five years later, guess what he does? He commits adultery. Why? I tell you, I, I don't know the complete reason why. But could it be? that because he was so judgmental upon his wife that God folded his arms saying, listen, pal, you're so judgmental on your wife. Yeah, what she did was wrong. 
but you got to forgive her or I won't forgive you. And I'll judge you like you judge her. So therefore, so he was so seething upset with his wife that he ended up committing adultery himself. And I find it happened to me with all sorts of things. I get angry at someone for doing something. How can they do that? That's wrong. They're so judgmental. How can they treat their people that bad? And then I treat someone that bad. So my friends, be very, very careful. I remember being in uh, Springfield, Missouri. I was going to Vail University, and uh, they don't know how to handle snow out there. I mean, if Jack Frost comes down, they close the whole city. So I'm sitting there walking, and people are falling on the ice. I'm laughing. Like, you guys don't know how to handle it in the Midwest. And as soon as I said it, bam, I, I bruised my tailbone, right? So be very careful because you will fall too. Be very careful when you judge other people. So what are we supposed to do instead? We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. So if someone's down in the dumps, why don't you help them get out of the dumps? If someone's struggling with their, with their marriage, if someone's struggling with their school, if someone's struggling in a relationship, if someone's struggling with all sorts of things, be very careful. You know, and don't sit there and judge. I remember a number of years ago, I'm going to go ahead and bring this example up. I remember it uh, back in the 1980s, I was traveling with a musical group, and there was this pastor that was talking about how smoking will send you to hell. I mean, he's just, he's just talking, he's sweating. He guy's like, it's like, he must have been 400 pounds. He's sitting there sweating, talking about getting a cigarette out of your mouth. I feel like saying, well, don't you get the Twinkie out of your mouth? <laughs> and then the Lord said to me, why don't you stop judging him? <laughs> but we often do that, right? We judge somebody, and I'm judging him for judging, right? I got my stuff, you got your stuff. Remember, if you enjoy bringing correction, don't do it. Don't do it. We are to bear one another's burden. Instead of, if someone's in a problem, help restore them. Do you have anyone in your life that you can help restore? This is why we have small groups. I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday in the parking lot, talking about how he loves a small group and how they were having a baby and they, they, they did a baby shower and their, people were praying for them and helping them and they were going through a hard time with some things and the, people were, the, the small group was reaching out and loving each other and helping each other. There's been situations where someone's come to me and said, you know what, you're wrong about this in a small group and it changed my life because they told me I was wrong about something and they did it with love and correction and help me out do you have anyone that can speak into your life when's the last time someone spoke into your life no one speaks into my life well it could be a couple of different things number one you're isolated or number two people don't want to tell you anything because you won't listen you have not arrived neither have i all of us are a work in progress we are to help each other become more like christ in a spirit of humility so bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Is that clear? You don't know someone else's background. You grew up in a perfect home. You grew up in Andy Griffin's town. They grew up with not a mother or father. You don't know what happened to the person. You don't know what took place, that they were abused. You don't know what's going on. I, I heard a story. Um, Charles Swindle. His name, Chuck, what's, what's his name again? Chuck Swindle, not Charles. Chuck Swindle was really irate. He was preaching a sermon at a conference, a large arena, and there was this guy in the first row. And he's like, the guy in the first row is like this. And, you know, I have to be honest. Can I be honest with you? Let me try. Okay. Please don't fall asleep on me. Okay. All right, I'll get a water pistol and shoot you. All right? I don't like it. Pastors don't like it. People are like... So the guy, the whole sermon is just... It's irritating him. He's trying to focus, and the person's right there. And so he gets done, and, and, and the audacity, the guy comes up after the sermon. He says, Pastor, I really loved your sermon. <laughs> He's like, thank you. And his wife goes, would you please forgive my husband? He has stage four cancer. He's on an experimental drug. It makes him really drowsy. I'm not done yet. This is a true story. And before he died, he wanted to come and hear you speak. Uh, the pastor said he felt like a size of an ant. He had it completely wrong. You don't know. You're not God. And neither am I. Be very careful. We do it as pastors. Well, that pastor is growing because it doesn't preach the gospel. We preach the gospel here at Cornerstone. That other church is growing. They preach a prosperity message. Really? Do you know that for sure? Yes, because they're growing. I mean, 
Do you know that for sure? Do you know that for sure? Do you know that pastor? Do you know what that pastor's going through? Or are you just reading the reports from people in their pajamas and basements, heresy hunters that sit there all day long taking little clips out of context? You don't know. So why don't you be quiet? Why don't you do some research? Gather all the facts. And don't read from sites that you can't trust, which is pretty much every site. Okay? Does that make sense, everybody? Gather the facts. You don't know, I don't know. So that's how we fulfill the love of Christ. So how do we judge? We judge with great humility. We, we don't judge hypocritically. We judge with redemption and with careful, great discernment. How we judge. What is that supposed to mean? Well, here it is. Here's Jesus' crazy statement here. Like, what is Jesus saying? It's not crazy, by the way. So don't think I'm being sacrilegious, but it sounds that way. He says it for a reason to get attention. He started with the thing in your eye, the log. Now he does this. Do not give what's holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Now, back in those days, dogs were not seen like they are today. Today, you go to West Hartford, you can go to a shop that has, has ice cream for dogs. Have outfits. The, the dogs dress better than I dress, which is not hard to do, by the way. So, I mean, people love their dogs. Okay? Cats are better. But people love their dogs. And, and, and so, but in that day, uh, most of them were just scavengers running around the city. And people had some hunting dogs. Some of them were domesticated. But generally speaking, dogs were not pets like they are today. And pigs? Pigs were unclean. We, I know people that have pigs here in the church. They say they have a cleaner mouth than the humans. I'm not going to find out. Okay? But um, so anyhow, another, another doctor told me this, by the way. And I, I talked about, you know, my triglycerides, he says. He said, you probably shouldn't have bacon. He, and he says, I don't eat bacon anymore. I said, why not? Because pigs are smarter than dogs. Just something to think about. <laughs> Pass the bacon. Okay. <laughs> Do not give what's holy to dogs, nor cast the pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. What's that supposed to mean? Some people are not able to hear what you're going to say to them. Sometimes the best thing to do is say nothing. When they're ready, you speak, or you blow your chances. You see, sometimes I, I've seen some high-profile ministers get interviewed by people, and all they're trying to do is trap them. And so they will not answer their question. Did you notice they try to trap Jesus? Is it lawful for a man? And he would ask with a question. And then people judge the pastors because they're not being forthright, because they're being trapped. They want to get a sound bite, and they won't give it to them. Okay, so be very careful. And, and sometimes people are not ready. I, I, I heard a pastor say this. Um, he had a, a pastor that I, I read about recently talk about this. He says, I went to a Bible-believing church all my life, but I never heard the gospel until I went away. Then I heard the gospel for the very first time. And then he went back and listened to the sermons. Every week, the pastor spoke the gospel. He wasn't ready to hear it yet. Some people don't have the aptitude yet to hear what you're going to say. You have to wait. By the way, it happens to me. I, used, I didn't listen to anything my father told me until I went to college, and also the professors were saying the same thing. You know what I'm saying, everybody? So sometimes don't put your pearls before swine because if you go and tell people things they don't want ready to hear yet. You know, sitting there at Westboro Baptist Church, burn, you're going to hell, it's not really very productive. You're going to get torn apart that way. Now, there may be a time where God tells you to speak out. That's one thing. But if you go around, you're trying to correct people, they're not ready for it yet. Don't waste your breath. I had no people. I've learned this now. I talked to some people. I said, they're not ready yet. Why don't you tell them? I'd be wasting my breath. I'll wait. I'll tell them a few nice things, but when they're ready, I'll speak to them. And then other people will speak to them. They're not going to hear it. And God has to open them. They have to be ready. Does that make sense, everybody? You start going around judging everyone, telling me that that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. You get yourself beat up. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, don't tell me. Okay. So we judge with great humility. We don't judge hypocritically. We judge with redemption. We with careful, great discernment. And here's the final one. We don't judge outsiders, but proclaim the gospel fully. Let me explain what that means. Okay, so this is what the Apostle Paul says. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? They're not, they're not in the, they're not in the, I don't know. 
I, I can't go out there and judge other people. Well, Pastor, what do you say about them? Hold on. Hold on before you throw tomatoes at me. Okay? For what have that to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you're to judge? Okay? Judge in the right, in the right sequence. God judges those outside. I mean, those outside the church, that's their job description. They're supposed to be acting that way. They don't know better, but we do. You see, before you start judging other people, get it right here first. You know, you know what it says when you go on an airplane? It's overused. I know that. But the oxygen mass falls from the ceiling. Before you give it to the baby, give it to yourself. Why? Because then you'll be able to help the baby. If we're going to help change society, make sure that you check yourself first. Then make sure we're doing it here. Then we have authority to go out there. But God judges the us outside. Purge the evil person from among you. That's right. There comes a point in time where someone might live a life in our community, and we've gone to them. We've spoken to them. We told them it's wrong. We took two or three witnesses. They refused to listen. It pains us, but we might have to disfellowship that person. So what about those on the outside? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Okay, here we go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That word nations is ethnos. ethnos. Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given to you and be sure of this. I am with you always to the end of the age. We're to go out and preach the gospel. This is what God says. This is what, I, I'm not going to look at you and say that you're this or the other. I don't know. All I know is that God saved me and he can save you. There is a day of reckoning coming. There is a day you're going to have to stand before God. Are you ready to meet God? That's a whole lot different. You sinner, you're going to go to hell. What good is that? But instead, you know what? If not for God, I would not be here today. We do it humbly. What you're doing is going to destroy you. I mean, a doctor will tell its patient if it has cancer or has a disease. Listen, your, your triglycerides are so high. Your high blood sugar is so high. If you don't take this medication, you could have a stroke and die. You say it because you love the patient, not because you lost your patience. And this is how we're supposed to reach the world. We say that, that Jesus loves you, and you're going to have to meet God. Are you ready to meet God? And we should stand up for truth. We should take care of those that are being misused and abused. Absolutely. You should be in school board meetings. You should go to the town and make sure they're teaching our kids a right curriculum. But don't do it angrily. Don't act like a political party does. Be biblical, not political. Say, you know what? This is damaging to our children. I am concerned about this. Speak it with humility. They're still going to get it wrong. They'll still judge you. But have the right heart and watch what God will do. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, don't tell me. Okay? Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always to the end of the age. Yes, we're supposed to preach the gospel. Yes, we're supposed to be salt and light in our culture, but make sure your heart is in the right place. And your heart's in the right place and you're humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. They're still gonna say you're arrogant. They're still gonna say you're judgmental. That's fine, but make sure your heart is right before God. That's why we need each other. That's why we need to be in community. That's why you can't do it by yourself. I'm telling you right now, this is difficult to do. You need community. That's why we encourage you to get involved with small groups. That's why I encourage you to get to know other people, that they can hold you accountable, that as a community of people, we can come together, make sure we're not being judgmental, speak the truth and love and power and strength, and we can change the world by the gospel, not by judgmentalism. This is what we're called to do. You see, judge without being judgmental. Do you understand? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word, Jesus. You told us what we are to do. We're not to lower our standards, but we are to be humble. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we would be salt and light in our culture today. We would speak the truth. We would help those that are being hurt. Lord God, that we'd stand for truth, that we'd be, uh, we would be purveyors of truth and healing. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to do it in a loving way. Father, I pray we were in correction that our hearts would ache and we would realize if it was not for you, none of us could stand. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd raise a sense of holiness in this place, that we would hold each other accountable because we love each other, because we want to see the best in each other. And Father, we would not be judgmental, but we would judge and we would have grace and we'd help each other and we'd restore each other gently lest we fall. 
I ask this in your name. 